You know I love you. Shut up. Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we are going to be doing a book review of this book, Thomas J. Orv's Pluriform Love. Now, it's not going to be your typical book review. We're not just going to flip to every chapter. Instead, we're going to dive in deep to, into some of the concepts he discussed, specifically, specifically Augustine's ideas of who God is, which fundamentally get featured within this book. So this book is primarily about love. How does the Bible use the word love? What does it mean in the Bible when it talks about love? What did other uh, theologians, such as the Calvinist tradition, how do they see God's love? Does God love? Uh, Augustine, it dives in deep into Augustine's mindset on love, being as he thought, Augustine thought of God as being immutable, ineffable, completely simple. Do these even line up? Are they even compatible with concepts of love, especially as described within the Bible? This is a biblical study on the word love. So anyone could get value out of it. The author Thomas J. Ord, he might be controversial in open theism, especially on the fundamentalist side of the spectrum, because he tends to approach the Bible with love as his ultimatum. He sees God is love and tends to emphasize texts in which talk about God being love and de-emphasize those texts in which he sees God as unloving. And so not all open theists fully endorse him. He's often called a process theist, although he doesn't seem to proclaim those values himself because of, uh, you know, there's so many definitions of these words going around and it doesn't really fit his theology. God can act, but not coercively within his views. But this book is not about that primarily. This book is primarily a Bible study. This book is primarily about love and church tradition. And so any person who's, who cares about the subject of love can pick it up and get immense value from it. This is going to be the best explanation, overview of love you're probably going to find. And it's coming from a non-traditional author. Now, Thomas J. Ord himself is an interesting figure. Uh, he's extremely charismatic individual. He's, his, he's a polymath. And so not only does he know a lot about philosophy and in history, uh, the Bible, um, but he's incredibly attuned to uh, to the the social uh, elements as well. Yeah, his one of his main skills comes along with organization, getting people together, uh, getting people to perform, to do things, and to act in concert with each other. And so uh, he's running currently the Center for Open and Relational Theology, which is a mixture of individuals from open and relational theological backgrounds. And he gets them involved in group projects. Well, we just had a big conference. Uh, it's the Center for Open and Relational Theology had a relational conference that was virtual, which was uh, very informative. And uh, there's a wide host, a wide diverse background of individuals who showed up presented, read book reviews. I did one of the book reviews for the life of Pinnock, the theology of Pinnock, not the life of Pinnock. But uh, so that's where Thomas J. Ord really shines as a, as a human being, as an individual. He's able to understand people, relate to people, understand socially how to communicate and to inspire people to achieve things. And so he's very good at that social element. Even my dad was commenting once. We went to a Thomas J. Ord event, which was very lightly attended. And when when we were when we were leaving the event, my my dad just he quipped about how how uh, put together Thomas Ord was. He didn't let it deter him that there wasn't very much turnout or make him sad. There there. He held a poker face. If he felt anything at all, he made everyone feel welcome. Uh, he in inspired confidence in everyone who presented and attended. Um, it wasn't it. These these little setbacks are not going to get him back. It set his personality back. This is this is who this individual is. So I have a lot of respect for Thomas J. Ord. Again, uh, he's he's skilled in various talents, various talents from theology to the Bible to even social social uh, organization, social organizer.
Now turning inside the book, this is Pluriform Love again, Thomas J. Ord, $7 on Amazon, so there shouldn't be any real price barriers to getting this information, adding this to your collection. But he, he quotes Millard Erickson, who is sometimes positioned as uh, a fair critic of open theism. I don't know what people are, probably because he's the least contemptuous when he writes against open theism. That And so open theists just tend to say, oh, uh, he's the most fair critic. No, he, he hates you the least. Um, so maybe that's why he's the most fair critic, but he's, he, he does make some sloppy mistakes. But uh, Millard Erickson is a Calvinist and his theology is explored. And so God's love in Calvinism, can God love? Remember their primary values, their attributes and their systematics is God can't receive from outside himself. If God were to love someone else, that means he'd be gaining value from outside himself, which would mean he's not the greatest good. He, it would violate uh, divine simplicity because simplicity cannot have relationality to other objects that in existence, divine simplicity negates that. All, all, these, all these concepts are explored in this book and Thomas J. Orr describes them pretty thoroughly. But what really struck me was this uh, Millard Erickson quote about God God's love and how that operates. Let's, let's, let's read this. God must choose his own glory ahead of all else. This, this is what I've been saying about Calvinism all the time on this podcast. Here, here's some de facto quotes from a Calvinist. To do anything else would be, in fact, a case of idolatry. So God must choose his own glory above all else. Why did God create the world to maximize his glory? And remember, it has to be like a mirror of his glory because he actually can't gain from outside himself. And so it's it's not giving him anything of value. Th this is this is their value set. Still in the quotes, when we think of God's love, a dilemma arises. Millard, uh, Millard Erickson admits, does he love us for his own sake, apparently jeopardizing the unselfish, giving character of his love, or does he love us of our own sake, thus apparently jeopardizing his status as the high, highest value? Just, just notice how this, this is phrased. If God loved us for our own sake, he would jeopardize his own value. God would not be the highest good. Millard Erickson, he's, he's putting this in a form of a rhetorical question, but this is what he actually believes, because here's his resolution. The former would seem to compromise the love of God, the latter his glory. There is, however, a third possibility. God loves us on the basis of that of himself, which he placed within us in creating. He therefore, in effect, loves himself in us. This means God's love for us and for his other creatures is completely disinterested. It is agape, not eros. Now, this is the ultimate conclusion of this Calvinist, Platonist theology and value set. God cannot love us. God loves himself, but he has to love himself in this perfectly simple way in which there's not two objects and with relation. So that's, it's not even a real love within God's, God's self, God's self, but it's, it, it can't be based on us. God can't gain value from us. God can't love us and get something in return. We can't be objects to God. We were objects in a way, as he quotes later Augustine talking about people, God, quote unquote, uses us. God does not love us. We are just objects for manipulation. Really? This, this, this is literally what they believe. Pick this book up and go read these sections. Now let's talk about the definition of love, how how Thomas Ord sees the Bible using this word. And what he does is he goes through a bunch of various instances in which the word is used and discuss, discusses the context and the meaning of the word within those contexts. And so just, just reading a few of his conclusions here. In this case, agape takes the form of life-giving love available to all. Skipping forward, agape, agape sometimes takes the form of self-sacrifice. Skipping forward, Agape involves obedience to God's commands. Skipping forward, agape here takes the form of familial love. Skipping forward, agape in Pauline writings. In the vast majority of instances, the Apostle Paul uses agape to mean the love that does good. Agape builds up. Uh, 
few references quoted, is generous to those in need and serves others. Agape spurs us to humility, meekness, patience, unity, and peace. Agape nourishes and cherishes others rather than hating them. This is what the Bible means when it uses the word love. Love actually has some sort of value for that object of the love. God loves us. God cares for us. God tries to give us value. We try to give value back to God. We see this within the Bible. Uh, King David, he laments, is like, God, if you let me die, I won't be around to sing your praises anymore. That is something you value. You value relationship. You re- you value man's praise. You value this community, this interaction. This, this is this is who God is within the Bible. God creates man. And what's the first thing he does? He calls the animals to Adam to see what Adam would call him. This, this is a relationship of curiosity, of, uh, of relationality. This is the actual picture of God within the Bible, not this Neoplatonic value set in which God has to maximize glory within himself, causing him unable to love others besides himself. And even the love he has for himself is not real love because there's no objects in that love. It's perfectly simple. All God's attributes are the same as all of God's other attributes in the classical model. So now let's turn to parts of Thomas J. Ord's book, which discusses Augustine's idea of love. Remember, in Augustine's idea, God is ultimate glory. God is ultimate value. So God cannot love us. He has to be loving himself. We, in turn, can only love God. We, we are not to love other people because that's idolatry, putting stuff ahead of God. This, this is where this theology leads. But this is a section called August, Augustine's God Doesn't Love Us. Quote, another subsection of teaching Christianity is titled God Does Not Enjoy Us But Makes Use of Us. The first statement in the title aptly describes Augustine's view. The second spa- statement does not at least not in the usual sense. Both statements have disturbing implication for Augustine's theology of love. To say God uses us seems contrary to Jesus' words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Uh, An alternative translation is, for God loved the world in this way that he gave his only son. God valued the world more than his son. That's what John is describing. Calvinists, they hate that concept. Remember that Todd White? When Todd White said that, the Calvinists lost their ever-loving minds because God loved the world more than his son. And that's, that's idolatry in their minds. God's putting something above himself. It seems to oppose with Apostle Paul's word that God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It seems in opposition to the Psalms, which speaks of God's steadfast love for creation. These passages and more say the world and its creatures benefit from divine love. God wants to promote our good and not use us. To explain his view, Augustine reminds us of what he considers love's true object. Quote, there still seems to be some uncertainty about what we have been saying, he admits, that we enjoy that thing which we love for its own sake and that we should use what does not make us perfectly happy or blissful, he says. Then Augustine poses a question to himself, how does God love us? According to Augustine's categories, he's asking, does God use or enjoy us? If God enjoys us, says Augustine, it means he is in need of some good of ours, which nobody in his right mind could possibly say. Every good of ours, after all, is either God himself or derived from him. Remember, that's Augustine's thought. To enjoy us, we must be able to contribute something God finds worth enjoying. Augustine thinks we have nothing of value to offer because God has all values eternity. In Calvinism, God cannot love us. Just keep this in mind. God cannot love us in Calvinism. In, In Augustinian Calvinism, especially this is this these are ideas from augustine and they're where are they coming from where's this value set coming from this, this, this is not a value set from the bible this is a value set straight from the pages of plotinus and uh, plotinus actually does get mentioned in this book which is actually pretty interesting these, these are platonic values this this is this this is this is normal 
Platonist values being imposed on Christianity. God can't love us. Ward writes, the only way God can love, desire us, according to Augustine's categories, is to use us. He does not enjoy us, this is a quote, but makes use of us, Augustine states, quote, because if he neither enjoys us nor makes use of us, I cannot find any way in which he can love us. Interesting quote. Inter interesting quote. Let, let's kind of just read that again. Because if he neither enjoys us nor makes use of us, I cannot find any way in which he can love us. So let's just kind of scroll down in Ord's work. Ord writes, Augustine can't say God loves us for our sakes. After saying God uses us, Augustine realizes he faces another problem. His notion of use implies God needs something, but this cannot be true according to his theology. He believes God is the only one with ultimate value and God has no needs. What use is creation to an entirely self-sufficient God? Remember, this, this what I'm reading is coming straight from Ord's book. His book is worth picking up. He, he explores these concepts, these, these Neoplatonic values, and contrasts them to biblical images of what it means to love. Augustine was not using the Bible. He's using a Platonic value set. This is Ord again. Augustine admits his problem. God, quote, does not make use of us either. He confesses, Augustine confesses, at least not, quote, in the same way as we use things, unquote. Augustine explains, quote, our making use of things is directed to the end of enjoying God's goodness, end quote. But God's making use of us is directed to his goodness. God doesn't use us. To use something means to gain value to interact with. So this would fundamentally violate Augustine's principles. So he even has to deny that. He says God uses us in a way, but not really, because that would actually give him outside relationship. That is a no-no. That's, that's not allowed in his theology. Let's skip down a few paragraphs. This is Ord again. We briefly encountered the idea that God only loves God's self when discussing Millard Erickson's theology. Like Augustine and many theologians in what many call classical theism, Erickson thinks God can only love God's self. The logic at play assumes love is desire and God is unaffected by creation. God has no needs. We'll address these issues in the next chapter, but I mention them to illustrate the continuing influence of Augustinian Augustine's theology today. When reflecting on the Trinity, Augustine says God ceaselessly loves God's self. This love is contemplation and enjoyment of divine life. His appeal to inter-Trinitarian love, however, does not solve his problems regarding God's love for creatures and creation. God doesn't love them. God neither loves creatures by enjoying them or using them, except insofar as in using them. God loves God's self. And God does not intend to promote their well-being. This is his primary definition of love in this book is promoting well-being. That's what love means. Here's this last quote. This is critical. Augustine's God does not love the world. This is true. In Augustinian theology and Calvinism, God does not love the world. So let's turn to on Christian doctrine. Now, I, th I, I believe I've done a podcast which goes over this first book. Uh, if if I haven't, someone let me know, and then I'll have to do this. But uh, this is pretty critical for setting up uh, the Augustinian idea of who God is. God's simplicity, immutability, uh, him being the primary value of himself. You could get it for free, uh, New Advent on Christian Doctrine, book one. This is what uh, Thomas Ord was quoting by a different title. We'll skip down to ineffability, which is described in this, this first book. Again, this lays out his conception of God. In what sense is God ineffable? Ineffable means you can't talk positively or of any way about God. Have I spoken of God, this is Augustine, or uttered his praise in any worthy way? Nay, I feel that I have done nothing more than desire to speak, and if I said anything, it is not what I desire to say. How do I know this except for the fact that God is unspeakable? But what I have said, if I have, if, if it had been unspeakable, could not have been spoken. And so God is not even to be called unspeakable. Because it is to say, to say this, even this, is to speak of him. Thus there arises a curious contradiction of words. Because if the unspeakable is what cannot be spoken of, it is not unspeakable if it is to be called unspeakable. And... This opposition of words is rather to be avoided by silence than to be explained away by speech. 
God isn't ineffable. He can't have predicates. We can't talk meaningfully about God. This is his idea of God. God can't be given values. Any, any type of values that we give God demeans God because God is the greatest good. Plotinus says, just call him the one or the good and just stop there. Stop talking about God. Even that concept is meaningless when you're talking about God. This is their value set. Let's kind of scroll through the chapter titles. God is to be esteemed above all else. El Let's kind of scroll through uh, these chapters and just try to get a sense of what he's talking here. Chapter 7, what all men understand by the term God. This is Augustine again. Uh, let's read this paragraph. Those, on the other hand, who endeavor by an effort of the intelligence to reach a conception of God. He's saying the smart people, not like those idiots who believe God has a body. Those people are dumb. And so um, the people who use their intelligence... They place him, God, above all visible and bodily natures, and even above all intelligent and spiritual natures that are subject to change. All, however, strive to enumously to exalt the excellence of God, nor could any one be found to believe that they that any being to whom there exists a superior is God. And so all concur in believing that God is that which excels in dignity over all other objects. Chapter 8, God is to be esteemed above all else. We talked about that in Augustine's theology. You can't really even love other people because that would be idolatry. You have to love God, and in that way you could love other people. Other people are just vessels or conduits to a love of God. 9, all acknowledge the superiority of unchangeable wisdom to that which is variable. Oh man, all those things that change are so degraded and worthless. To see God, the soul must be purified. Yeah, so Augustine's theology is a theology of ascent. And so um, it, it's not really touched on in the Ord book. But for Augustine, the goal of religion is a spiritual ascent to higher realms of existence, to, to reemerge with the one. This, this is a goal in Platonism. So what he would do is he'd go into introspective, meditations and try to purge the physical purge the change and to reunite with the one to to go up to those different levels of existence and so in this way this is why we can't love other people because loving other people is loving what's changeable it's not loving the one pure essence who god is the, loving people pulls us downwards loving the world pulls us downwards those things are change we have to set our mind on only the unchangeable and, and and seek to reunite to that unchangeable thing. This is Augustine's theology. This is this is literally what he believed. In what sense the wisdom of God came to us? The word was made flesh. How the wisdom of God healed men. So in Augustine's mind, the purpose of Jesus is Jesus is a, a uniting conduit between between the different realms. And we use him as like a totem or or some sort of pathway. To, to enable our ascent to the one. This, this is the purpose of Jesus in Augustine's religion. Remember, uh, the changeable parts of Jesus are not God. In, in Augustine's religion on the Trinity, he writes that it's just like uh, the voice from heaven. It's just like the dove coming down. These are just mutable things in time. There, there's, a, there's an unchangeable element behind all of that. And that thing is God. God cannot even love himself in a trinitarian sense in which there's multiple objects multiple persons of the trinity loving each other god is simple and without parts and so those categories of god's love have to be denied even among the trinity so we're going to actually have to go back and go through augustine's writings and in detail what he says and what he claims about god but let's flip to the next book very briefly just point out this is one of the instances in which he heaps praises on the platonists those Platonists are the closest to true religion in Augustine's mind. I remember uh, his friend says, hey, Augustine, your words, your works are full of Plato, Platonus, and Christ. Those three things, that's the major elements. That's how he's categorized by his own friends. He, he readily admits it himself. So here's what he says about Platonists within this book, Church Doctrine. Moreover, if those who are called philosophers, and especially the Platonists, 
have said anything that is true and in harmony with our faith, we are not only to shrink from it, but to claim it for our own and use it from those who have unlawful possession of it. Earlier in the book, he, he talks about how Plato, oh man, Jesus didn't get his teachings from Plato, but Plato, in fact, got them from uh, Moses because Plato went to Egypt once. And see, see, Plato went to Egypt once, and so all Plato's teachings were from uh, the, the Bible. Fantastic. Uh, true scholar. Thank you. And he actually attributes this to Ambrose because this is something Ambrose was seeking to prove because Ambrose, of course, was the bishop who initiated Augustine into a lot of these ideas. He said, hey, don't read the Bible literally. You have to read it in spirit. And by spirit, they meant in the spirit of Platonism. Platonize the text. Don't care what the text says. See it in a spiritual light. See it symbolically and reinterpret it in light of Platonism. This is their idea. So we see where that gets us. And there's 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 not there's not very many good books out there on love. I'm sure there there's probably some that people could recommend, but this one I think is the one that people probably should get uh, just for the scholarly aspect of how it goes through love, describes what love is, gives gives definitions, gives gives working definitions, gives technical definitions, and compares the usages to the false depictions of love that have been set up in classical Christianity. This false conception of love in Calvinism. It's not love. In Calvinism, in Augustine's theology, God cannot love. We are not objects of love. We, we hold no value to God. We do not give God any value. To, for God to love us would be a fundamental violation of their metaphysics. This is critical. This is critical stuff being taught here. So in short, uh, the book is actually pretty good, uh, surprisingly good. I would suggest getting it, and I would suggest reading it. Augustine and Calvinism, th these are Platonic values. They have no place in the church. They're not part of the church, and their values are alien to the text. And it, it's been being de-emphasized regularly within open theism how destructive these pagan ideas are which have been incorporated into the church, it's being de-emphasized how, how, how much harm these, these values actually create. God cannot love us. Anyways, questions and comments, put that down below or start a thread on the God is Open Facebook page. Thank you for listening.